reach across time and see yourself. You stand tall against terrifying enemies. You build masterpieces and break down barriers. You rush into the future and meet your past. For every time, at every moment, the official network of every millennium. The History Channel, where the past comes alive. Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. In the early 20th century, a black middle-class community called Greenwood thrived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, despite segregation and Jim Crow laws. Booker T. Washington declared Greenwood as a Negro Wall Street of America. But all of Greenwood's achievements and successes were destroyed during a night of murder and mayhem. It was never in the history books or anything, and yet it was the biggest riot that we've ever had in America. As we go in search of history, we'll uncover a little-known event that was one of the worst racial riots in American history, the night Tulsa burned. Nineteen twenty-one. The Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, is the center of African American life for the more than eleven thousand black residents of the city. Within this community lie one hundred and eight black-owned businesses, two theaters, two black schools, and fifteen doctors' offices. In fact, Greenwood is nationally recognized. Booker T. Washington, who came through here en route to Muskogee. When he saw uh, the glitter and glamour and the bustling businesses, he declared Greenwood as a Negro Wall Street of America. And since the Civil Rights Movement, we had updated it to the Black Wall Street of America. Barred from shopping and socializing elsewhere in Tulsa, blacks build a place of their own. Greenwood. We had everything out on Greenwood and the, and the Negro area that you needed. There were drug, sto we had drug stores, grocery stores, cleaners, hotels. All of that, of course, was destroyed when the riot came. On May 31st, 1921, in what has been described as the worst race riot in American history, Greenwood is destroyed. In less than 24 hours, a white mob reduces Black Wall Street to 36 square blocks of smoldering rubble. Scores of African Americans are killed and thousands are left homeless. White Tulsans not only invaded Black Tulsa, they not only looted homes and businesses, they burned it to the ground. The entire black community, aside from a few outlying areas, was absolutely put to the torch. The devastation of this community means much more than the destruction of its buildings. The residents, the men, women, and children who struggled to create this haven will be forever scarred. Now remember the race riot and how mean people were during the race riot and the relationship between white and black at that time. And I wondered how people could be so mean. Because of its history, Oklahoma would seem to be one of the last places where such a terrible incident could happen. Beginning in the 1830s, Oklahoma became the home of many minority groups unwanted by the rest of America, a promised land. The lure of Oklahoma in the late 1800s, even the early 1900s, was clearly um, a better life for African Americans. There was an abundance of land. Everything was new, especially when we talk about pre-statehood. Before becoming a state, Oklahoma was part of America's frontier. Throughout the 18th and the 19th century, with all the settlement along the eastern seaboard, 
the American frontier kept pushing further and further west. And ultimately, it ran into some large, well-organized native groups, the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Seminoles, and others. Wanting the expansion and development of North America to continue unabated, the U.S. government began the forced migration of these Native American groups from the southeastern United States to the newly created Indian Territory, which included most of present-day Oklahoma. This migration took place along the infamous Trail of Tears, an arduous, often deadly journey covering thousands of miles. Accompanying the Native Americans on this journey were many African Americans, most of whom were slaves owned by the Indian tribes. The Native American peoples we were talking about came from the southeastern part of the United States, and they had had 200 years of exposure to plantation society, and many of them were plantation owners themselves, and they brought their slaves with them when they came to Oklahoma. The end of the Civil War would bring freedom to these slaves. It would also see the beginning of the end of Native American dominance in these new lands. At the end of the Civil War, because the Native American tribes were primarily supporters of the Confederacy as a form of punishment, let's say, the Indian Territory was divided into half, and so we wound up with what was famously known as the Twin Territories of Oklahoma Territory and Indian Territory. Responding to pressure from white settlers, President Benjamin Harrison opened the Oklahoma Territory to new settlement on April 22, 1889. With this proclamation, the first race was on to stake claims for homesteads on the new frontier. Within 24 hours, two million acres were claimed by 50,000 settlers. Among these settlers were blacks, searching for a place where freedom might be more than just a piece of paper. My grandfather was in the Oklahoma land run. His name was David Monroe. My grandfather moved from, from Dalton, Missouri, looking for a better life. Three covered wagons. That's why he moved in. From the beginning of Oklahoma history, modern Oklahoma history, African Americans have always been a part of it. They were cowboys, they were cattle punchers, they were farmers. Uh, they helped build the railroad, they helped build all the cities. By the end of 1890, the black population in the Oklahoma region stood at about 3,000. By 1900, the figure had grown to more than 55,000. Oklahoma was such a place of promise for some African Americans that some even decided to try and see if they could turn Indian Territory into the nation's only, first and only, all-black state. One of these visionaries was a man named Edwin McCabe, who had been the former state auditor of Kansas. Edwin McCabe moved to Oklahoma in 1889 and founded the town of Langston. While McCabe's dream of an all-black state was not achieved, the calls to come to Oklahoma were heeded by many African Americans. As a result, 27 all-black towns were created in Oklahoma during the years leading up to statehood. When Oklahoma became a state in 1907, there was great rejoicing throughout the state and through the territory, and amongst black Oklahomans as well. But very soon, the racial climate started to change. After the Constitutional Congress, after the state it was approved, the first bill, the first bill segregated the state. Despite this bill by the new government, blacks remained in Oklahoma, living in both all black towns and Oklahoma's cities. One of those cities was Tulsa. Though begun in the 1830s as a Creek Indian village, Tulsa would remain a sleepy frontier town for decades. Not until 1882, with the arrival of the railroad, would whites live there in large numbers. But the event that truly spurred on the city's dynamic growth was the discovery of the Ida Glen Oil Range in 1905. 
Once oil was discovered, Tulsa absolutely skyrocketed. There were a thousand people here in 1900. In 1910, there were 10,000. In 1920, there were 100,000 people here. Boosters called it the magic city because it just showed up overnight. The forest of derricks that sprang up were soon producing more than 2,000 barrels of oil per day. By the time it was admitted to the Union in 1907, Oklahoma led the nation in oil production. The wealth oil generated went mainly to the whites who owned the oil wells. But blacks also benefited as the money trickled down. As Tulsa boomed, black Tulsa boomed too. But the city, like the rest of the state, was also under Jim Crow laws, segregation laws. So while black people could work in jobs throughout town, they couldn't live anywhere in town, nor could they shop anywhere. So as a result, a number of enterprising young black entrepreneurs started to create a business district. In 1905, the Greenwood District gets its first business, a grocery store on the corner of Greenwood Avenue and Archer Street. From this humble start, Greenwood soon flourishes into the vital, exciting center of African-American life in Tulsa. By 1921, it is a place of limitless opportunities, both economic and social. At that time, Greenwood had business, business, and business. Everything was happening there. We had the Dreamland Theater, we had drug stores, we had dance halls, pool rooms, shine parlors. That's where everybody just hung out. People go down one side of Greenwood and up the other, and you, you could see the fashions and, and it, all of that. During this era, Tulsa is essentially two cities, the black north end and the white south end. And that was segregation days, you know. So we didn't go very far to the south. We just worked over there, that's about all. The, the black people couldn't get anything in Tulsa, uh, downtown. They couldn't go to the restroom, they couldn't eat. It was entirely segregated. But far from stifling African-American economic success, this segregation helps Greenwood grow. I think the success based on segregation has to do with simple economic principles of supply and demand. There's a demand for, for goods. Um, one cannot purchase those goods in, in the larger context of the white community. So there's a, there's a need for black individuals to produce and to supply those goods. Despite the success blacks have in creating their own community, Tulsa is still a white-dominated society. White policemen could come into the community at any point and arrest anyone. Most of the wage earners in Black Tulsa had white bosses. So Black Tulsa, while it boomed and had a measure of independence, was also under the thumb of White Tulsa's political and police authorities. Many African-American communities in the United States were thriving in the 1910s and 20s. But the high level of home ownership in Greenwood made Tulsa's black district distinctive. Now, for some white people, a black person with any wealth, then as well as today, is something that they created jealousy. Race relations in Tulsa were poor in the early 1900s. Um, the KKK had a, an enormous presence in Oklahoma um, and in Tulsa particularly. This era would see the racist roots of segregation boil over into numerous armed conflicts throughout the United States. The Tulsa Race Riot of 1921 it really is set against the backdrop of a multitude of race riots in America. Uh, 1919 was known as Red Summer because literally blood was flowing in the streets. There were over 25 major race riots in 1919 uh, in America. These riots occur in Minnesota, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere throughout the country. The worst riot during the summer of 1919 is in Chicago, which leaves 38 people dead and 1,000 black families homeless. The important thing to remember about race riots during this period 
is that they are characterized by white invading black communities. These are not black communities that are erupting. These are white, uh, white citizens, sometimes aided by the police, who are en masse invading black communities, attacking black businesses, and attacking black homes. In 1921, the fires of racial intolerance spread to Tulsa. The person who serves as the spark for Tulsa's riot is Dick Rowland. A 19-year-old black man, Rowland dropped out of Booker T. Washington High School so he could earn some money shining shoes in downtown Tulsa. While some kids stayed in high school and went ahead and graduated, there was also a great desire by many others to go out and make some money. And you could make money in Tulsa. Even a boot black could shine an oil man's shoes and might get a tip of a dollar or five dollars. That was incredible money in 1920, 1921. So to drop out of school was not all that unusual. He worked downtown, and during that era, the era of the right 1921, there was really only one restroom that was readily accessible to African Americans. And it was on an upper floor of a downtown building called the Drexel Building. The elevator operator at the Drexel Building is a young white woman named Sarah Page. On the morning of May 30th, 1921, as he often did, Dick Rowland went into the Drexel Building, got onto the elevator to go and use the restroom. But something happened on the elevator. I'm not exactly sure what did, but what probably happened is that as he stepped onto the elevator, he tripped and fell into Sarah Page. To this day, no one knows for certain what happened when those elevator doors closed. But what is known is that shortly after entering the elevator, Dick Rowland was seen running out, leaving behind a screaming Sarah Page. Tuesday, May 31st, 1921. One day after Dick Rowland allegedly assaults Sarah Page on an elevator in downtown Tulsa, the police arrest Rowland and take him to the jail on the top floor of the courthouse. The incident becomes the talk of Tulsa. As the story went around that he had touched her, hit her, knocked her to the ground, and it escalated and became more inflammatory with each telling. Ultimately, things just steamrolled, totally out of control. And, and a large player in all this was the Tulsa Tribune, one of the major papers in town. The Tulsa Tribune ran a story titled, Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in Elevator. This inflammatory article strongly implies that Dick Rowland, a black man, had raped the young white elevator operator, Sarah Page. 3.15 p.m., the newspaper hits the streets of Tulsa. Over the next 17 hours, the city will be consumed by a race riot on a scale never before seen in America. By about 4 o'clock, you start to have a crowd of whites gathering in front of the courthouse, the downtown courthouse, where Dick Rowland was held. Over the next couple of hours, that crowd grows in size from 100 to 200 to 300 to 400 people. 8.20 p.m., Tulsa's Sheriff Willard McCullough orders a group of armed whites out of the courthouse. When his instructions for the crowd to disperse are ignored, McCullough takes precautions to protect Dick Rowland. He guards uh, all of the stairways leading up to the top floor of the jail. He also uh, disconnects the uh, elevator going on and posted armed guards up to where Dick Rowland was held. 9.15 p.m. False reports that the courthouse is being stormed by the white mob reach Greenwood, where the community is gathering to discuss what action they should take. African-American men in Tulsa decided that it was time to take a stand, that lynching a 19-year-old black man for uh, an alleged assault was going too far. Immediately, a group of armed African-Americans, including World War I veterans, rushed to the courthouse and offered to help defend the jail. Assured by the sheriff that Roland would be safe, the men returned to Greenwood. The white mob, however, remains. That might have been the end of the story, but it wasn't. 
After seeing this initial group of blacks, whites then started to arm themselves uh, much more so than they had. 10.30 p.m. The white mob swells to about 2,000. Once again, word reaches Greenwood that a lynching is imminent. A group of armed blacks returns to the courthouse. Again, they are turned away. But as they were walking back to their cars, a white came up to a black vet and said, where are you going with that gun, nigger? And the black vet said, I'm going to use it if I have to. And the white man said, no, you ain't. A tussle started off, a shot was fired, and the race riot was on. The situation in Tulsa quickly spirals out of control. After those first shots were fired, at that point, the white rioters forgot about Dick Rowland entirely, and they were out to get all blacks for what they perceived as crimes against whites by blacks. During the rest of the night, small excursions by whites into the district are repelled, but the residents of Greenwood will not be able to hold them off for long. Once the sun was up and the mass invasion of Greenwood happened, whites would typically come in, they would be fighting gun battles with blacks who were defending their homes and businesses before being overwhelmed. When the riot starts, many police officers abandon their duties. They side with the white rioters, deputizing many of them and detaining as many blacks as possible. Black men were rounded up and taken to detention centers on the notion that that would be for their protection. But what that did was essentially to leave the black community defenseless. We're taking you down, boy. We're taking you down. Let's go. Anybody who was white could arrest, detain, anything to anybody who was black and get by with it. And in fact, they were encouraged to do so. Listen, boy. Come on, hey, come on. Hey. I remember men taking my father to a place where they kept prisoners at Levant and Elgin, McNulty Park. Other than that, I never saw my father anymore during the race ride. I just remember my mother taking care of us. The early morning hours of June 1st, 1921 with most members of the community in detention centers. Their homes and businesses are looted and burned. I will always remember four men coming in our house with torches, and my mother saw them coming, and she put the four of we children under the bed. And from under the bed, we could see them walking to the curtains and setting fire to the curtains to set our house on fire. We start hearing shots, and my grandfather told us all to get up. And we got up, and we could see smoke. And, and, and hear, hear shots, and we couldn't sleep or anything. We, we were just frightened nearly to death. The next two, three days, it was June, and school was going to be out. I was sitting up studying my lesson for an exam for the next day. And someone banged on that door, put that light out, but as soon as daylight came, oh, we looked outside. All of these people were coming down this railroad track. We didn't nobody try to take a thing. And those people were coming along with track. They just had clothes on, that's all. Didn't try to take anything. Once authorities in Tulsa realized that the city was really out of hand, a decision was made to go ahead and request the National Guard. So a telegram was sent to Governor Robertson who authorized the Adjutant General to send the National Guard into the city. 9.15 a.m. 17 hours after the mob began to gather outside the courthouse, Oklahoma City units of the National Guard arrive in Tulsa. Martial law is declared at 11.29. The National Guard takes control of the city and puts an end to the violence, burning, and looting. The troops also round up the remaining African Americans and take them to internment centers. The white rioters are disarmed, 
but for the most part are simply sent home. Greenwood lay in ruin. Confusion lingers in the wake of the riot. Estimates on the death toll are uncertain, and uncounted numbers of blacks leave Tulsa never to return. The number of dead in the riot has historically been a subject of some controversy. The best evidence suggests that upwards of 300 people died in the riot. Uh, I talked to the sexton at uh, Oaklawn Cemetery, and he said that truckloads had been brought in and they were buried in the pauper's field uh, in the southwest corner of Oaklawn. Another disputed fact is whether airplanes were used to drop bombs on Greenwood during the riot. I remember that they said our airplane was dropping kerosene on the houses from an airplane. I don't ever remember uh, the airplane. I've had so many people say that I don't see how you didn't, couldn't remember it years ago. But at five years old, I just didn't pay any attention to it. The evidence is strong that airplanes were used in, in, in the riot. Um, some say that, that bombs were, were dropped. Others say that nitroglycerin was, was dropped to propel the, the fires that were, that were going. What is certain in the aftermath of the riot is that Greenwood has been permanently altered. At that point, you had a city that was changed forever. Nearly 50 square blocks had been burned to the ground. Nearly a tenth of the population was held under armed guard at, uh, at internment centers. In less than 24 hours, a marauding white mob has transformed a black promised land into a smoldering wasteland. An estimated 300 dead, more than 6,000 blacks in internment centers, over 1,000 black homes and businesses decimated. When we rode through Greenwood, I said, we will never, 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 ever come back here. Thought we would never, ever come back. There was not a building standing. After more than 17 hours of anarchy, the race riot is quelled and the flames of Tulsa are extinguished but the scars would take much longer to heal. The riot didn't really end when the, when the martial law was declared and when the state troops came. There were reverberations that went on for many, many months, and in fact, years after that. The physical damage left in the wake of the rampaging white mob is immense, estimated at $5 million. That $5 million that is successful was lost in today's dollars, it would be in the billions. The enormity of the devastation in Greenwood is staggering. This physical damage is matched by the impact of the riot on its residents. Despite not being accused of committing any crimes, most of the African Americans in Tulsa are locked up in internment centers, some held for days. Ultimately, the economy of Tulsa began to come to a grinding halt because all these black men who were doing these so-called menial jobs um, were, were absent. And these jobs were necessary for the economy to move forward. Faced with economic loss, white employers arrange for the release of the African Americans from the detention centers. But to gain their freedom, African Americans must wear specially issued tags signed by their employers. Most folks, once they were released from the internment centers, came back, got busy, and got to work again rebuilding their community. But rebuilding would not be easy in the face of the awesome destruction. After the riot, because there was so much devastation in the Greenwood community, including a lot of homes, um, a lot of the victims of the riot literally lived in tent cities. The Red Cross helps spending at least $100,000 in its humanitarian relief efforts. There is no doubt but the American Red Cross is the true angel of mercy during the Tulsa race riot and in the months that followed. The Red Cross provided food, 
The Red Cross provided tents and building materials to uh, make platforms for tents. They found ways to provide medicine. They created a hospital in North Tulsa. At the same time the residents of Greenwood begin the long process of rebuilding, White Tulsa begins what will be an even longer process of coming to terms with its responsibilities for the riot. The white political and business leaders of Tulsa are embarrassed by the reality of what happened. The city establishes a reconstruction committee which issues pronouncements of shame and makes pledges to rebuild Greenwood. In point of fact, they did absolutely the opposite. And the most important event that they did, the most important action that the Reconstruction Commission did, was to try and steal the land where the black community had been to use that as an industrial park or as, a, as the site of a new railroad station. To accomplish this goal, a new fire ordinance is enacted mandating all construction meet tough new requirements. The additional costs of these requirements would make rebuilding Greenwood nearly impossible for its residents. Fortunately for them, a lawyer by the name of Buck C. Franklin is among those displaced by the riot. B.C. Franklin, who's the father of noted historian Dr. John Hope Franklin of Duke University, uh, was a lawyer here in Tulsa whose offices were destroyed in the riot. B.C. Franklin and his partners literally pitched a tent and set up their practice out of that tent. Franklin had only moved to Tulsa a few months before the riot. But from his makeshift law office in a tent, Franklin and his partners mount a challenge to the validity of the fire ordinance. The Oklahoma Supreme Court strikes down the new ordinance, opening the way for the residents of Greenwood to rebuild. A week after the riot, a state grand jury is impaneled to investigate and charge those responsible for the atrocities. The upshot of that is that the grand jury issued um, a sharply worded report that essentially said black people brought this on themselves. That was the, that was the bottom line. Given the, given the era, the historical era, that is not a shocking or surprising result. Although the grand jury files charges against various people, none of the cases is tried. Despite all of the killing, burning, and looting that transpired during the riot, no white person will ever be sent to prison. And the incident, the alleged rape that precipitated the riot? Dick Rowland's elevator encounter with Sarah Page would also never go to trial. Sarah Page wouldn't testify against Dick Rowland, so Dick Rowland was exonerated from any charges of attempted rape or anything else that might have happened in the Drexel building. And not surprisingly, Dick Rowland left town. And as it turns out, Dick Rowland was safe. But the community was destroyed. Bolstered by the grand jury report laying the blame on African Americans, White Tulsa goes on as if nothing has happened. The African Americans of Tulsa are again segregated in Greenwood, left to rebuild on their own with no city assistance. All the time when the city is trying to steal their land, black Tulsans are busy. They're building their homes out of packing crates. They're building their homes out of any sort of lumber that they can get. But the rebuilding has to do with that spirit, the willing to succeed, the willing to reinvest. And it happened, and it became bigger and better than ever. The story of Greenwood is not that there was a riot. The story of Greenwood is that there was resilience after the riot. One of the great miracles is the rebuilding of Mount Zion Baptist Church, which had opened only three months before it was destroyed in the riot. All that is left is a $50,000 mortgage. It was very difficult to rebuild, but Somehow they made a determination that the first obligation would be to pay off the old mortgage that they owed on the church. It took a few decades, but ultimately they rebuilt the church and they paid off the mortgage.
The Tulsa race riot of 1921 devastates all of Greenwood, but it does not destroy the dreams or spirit of its residents. Though there is little help from outside, the district is reborn as a dynamic African-American community for a while. Even though Greenwood rebuilt itself and really had another heyday in the 1930s and the 1940s, Deep Greenwood, the commercial district, would not last. And there are different reasons for it. One, of course, is desegregation. And uh, once black Tulsans were allowed to shop in other neighborhoods, they often did. And once that captive market was dispersed into the broader market at large, they couldn't survive. They were not economies of scale that would permit them to achieve what they had when they had, you know, a forced audience. Then in the 1960s, urban renewal efforts of the federal government contribute to the community's decline. Many of Greenwood's buildings are destroyed to make way for a new interstate highway that would run right through the middle of the district. Ironically, the government programs would inflict more permanent damage on Greenwood than the riot. For decades, the events of that night in 1921 were rarely, if ever, discussed in Tulsa. There was what I would describe as a conspiracy of silence after the riot. The leadership here didn't really want to talk about it. And this went on for years and years and years. I went all through school and never mentioned it. It was never in the history books or anything, and yet it was the biggest riot that we've ever had in America. It was really a, a, a sort of a chilling period in, in Tulsa history to have such a major event, one of the most important events in the history of the city, be suppressed and something you didn't want to talk about. Indeed, it seems as though some in Tulsa even tried to physically erase reports of the riot. One such record that no longer exists is an inflammatory editorial from the Tulsa Tribune, which some say helped ignite the riot. No one can locate a copy of this, but it's an editorial that some of the riot survivors will tell you about um, that is entitled something to the effect, to lynch a Negro tonight. The reason we don't have that editorial is that sometime in the 1930s, somebody very carefully cut out that one editorial out of the bound volumes of the Tulsa Tribune. So when those volumes were later microfilmed, there was no copy of it. But the story of the night Tulsa burned would not be suppressed forever. If we're going to be able to look forward towards a better future, we have to look all this awful, scarred, um, depressing pass in the square in the face. We can't be afraid of our history. We have to grapple with it. We have to understand how these things happen so we can prevent them in the future. After more than 75 years, Tulsa and Oklahoma is officially ready to examine the question of what happened and why. The Tulsa Race Riot of 1921 happened for a number of reasons, and the, that incident between Dick Rowland and Sarah Page was simply a spark. If that hadn't happened, something else would have happened. Unlike the rest of Tulsa, African Americans never forgot the riot or the great promise and prosperity of Greenwood. Beginning in the 1970s, residents started planning the Greenwood Cultural Center built at a cost of more than three million dollars coming from the residents of greenwood as well as city and state governments the center was opened in 1989. the center serves as an archive on the history of the riot but just as importantly it celebrates the achievements and contributions of tulsa's african-american residents it's a good thing, it's a good beginning, it's a good start. We needed the cultural center. We need the cultural center to let us know that Tulsa is growing into a better city after all of these years. In 1996, the 75th anniversary of the riot was marked with the dedication of a monument to Black Wall Street on the grounds of the Greenwood Cultural Center. Ceremonies were held at the nearby Mount Zion Baptist Church. 
we had a great big celebration here. And there were many speakers. And uh, Benjamin Hooks, the president of the NAACP, came here and spoke. And then we marched from here over to the Cultural Center and lit the flame for the memorial to Black Wall Street. With these initial steps, Tulsa had begun to come to terms with the travesty of the race riot. We can't change our history, no matter how negative it is. What we can do is take our history and learn from it and grow into the future. Maybe if we talk about it enough, it'll never be again. A decades-long effort to suppress the facts of the night that Tulsa burned nearly succeeded. But the survivors of that horrific event would not let this story be lost to history. The devastation of a vital community by a racist mob is not an easy past to confront, but one we must face if we are truly to go in search of history. <laughs>